everybody, what's going on? Dan Schinder here on Yes Shift Live, our second live episode here with Steve. Steve, what's the show about again? So we're a father-son podcast. I'm the son, you're the dad, and we talk about Yes and different people associated with Yes, and we talk prog, and it's a really fun time. And I forgot to cue up the music, which is okay. And we're thrilled as <laughs> fudge to have on once again Mike Tiano to talk about some really cool, interesting stuff. Mike, how are you up there in Seattle? I'm doing great, uh, uh, Stephen. Uh, thanks for asking. Uh, I hope you and Dan are doing fine. Great, great, great. We are really interested in today's topic. And folks, we'll be watching the show on our respective monitors. So let us know if you have questions for Mike, because we have some really interesting uh, stuff to cover. And we posted that the interview is going to be coming up. Steve collected some questions already from the audience. I have questions. Steve has questions. Even Mike has questions about Mike. So this will be an interesting interview. Mike is responsible. Now, I want everyone to really feel the gravitas of this statement. Mike is responsible pretty much for putting yes on the internet. That's like he's what NASA was to Neil Armstrong getting to the moon, right? Mike, back in whatever, tell us what year that was and how did that conversation go and who was it with? Did they know about the internet? Like, I fantasized about how this must have gone. <clears throat> Give us the scoop, dude. Uh, uh, actually, it's kind of a funny story. Um, so, um, as you know, I was uh, associated with Notes from the Edge, and that's how I kind of got involved. I got to know Alan White, who is a local, and uh, I interviewed him, and I started to become friendly with the other Yes members. Um, uh, particularly Steve Howe. Steve Howe and I were pretty good friends for a long time. And um, uh, and they they kind of had an idea what the internet was, but but they weren't really, I don't think they really grasped it for a really long time or grasped just how how important and how immediate the internet was to people. Um, uh, uh, it, it, when, when some bad news would go out, well, people would say, did you put it out there? Because they thought I was the internet. <laughs> you know what? Um, <laughs> So what happened was, um, I kept telling you, you know, you, know, you should have your an official website, and I was I was going to help spearhead it with um, uh, Doug and Glenn Gottlieb, so the Yes Magazine would have have um, an affiliation with it, and and the Kachopo's uh, Yes Music Music Service. I can't remember what it was called, but uh, <clears throat> my my concept was the three of us would um, um, would kind of manage Yes World, and um, I basically. Uh, had an idea on how to propose that. Uh, I thought that I would go to Microsoft. I worked at Microsoft at the time. I just shipped Windows 95. And um, I basically uh, went to uh, the MSN folks and said, hey, hey you know, um, uh, why don't you do, uh, maybe as far as a big MSN event, because they just launched, uh, maybe have an inter interview with the members of Yes. And they said, that's a pretty good idea. I said, well, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll conduct a presentation to them. The presentation was really about Yes World. So I got them in Los Angeles. I flew in Los Angeles. And I got them to, to um, uh, you know, drive over from their AV facility there in the LA area, uh, a monitor, uh, and I would have a laptop, and I had a PowerPoint presentation that I was going to present to uh, the members of Yes um, as far as how the, the whole schema would work and how um, – I and the others would manage Yes World. And who um, was at that meeting, Mike? <clears throat> what? Who was uh, at I'll, I'll, that? I'll, I'll, I'll get to that. I'll okay. get to that in a minute. Because <clears throat> um, um, just as a sidebar, um, sure. I know we're not attorneys, but I we, I say sidebar, right? As a sidebar, basically, um, just to show you just how clueless Yes we were about the internet. Um, uh, I mentioned this to Steve about having an online or you know. Uh, uh, internet interview with band members and you're saying well i really don't see myself uh, or so standing around the fax machine getting questions <laughs> 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 like, uh, and, uh, that's, uh, and that's uh, that's uh, steve no, no no it doesn't work that way so um so i go down to la and basically at that time rick was going to rejoin the band you know trevor was already out he already said i'm, I'm done with this talk talk had kind of tanked Unfortunately, and then Trevor had a, a you know a lucrative career uh, writing scores for motion pictures. Right. Um, yeah. So the the plan was for 
um, Lee Abrams, who worked for Atlantic Records for the longest time. Uh, he was a, a real proponent for progressive rock when he was there. Um, and I still know Lee Abrams today. And with the plans for Lee Abrams and Tony K to manage, yes, which would be John, Steve, Chris, Alan, and uh, Rick. Um, so uh, it was in John's house. He was living in Pacific Palisades at the time. So you know, I go over there, set up the monitor, and I'm presenting to six Yes members. Like I say, Tony was there too, and Lee Abrams. And 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 uh, well, you know, it's a little bit uh, uh, nerve wracking, but at the same time, I already kind of knew them, so I, I kind of laid out the whole scheme for them. And uh, they said, "Yeah, that's a good idea." And um, I worked out like a, um, a compensation arrangement to where. Um, really, as long as we got great concert tickets and credits on the albums, <clears throat> we, you know, we'd be their buddies, really. You know, I knew Steve. I uh, introduced some of the other Yes World members or NFT members who became, you know, more to the Yes World members, um, staff members. Um, they had associations so, uh, with personal associations with various members. Uh, and um, so um, uh, I, I launched Yes World. Um, the idea being that, you know, at that point, there were so many um, members in and out of Yes. I mean, Patrick Moraz, Tony K, as I mentioned, you know, uh, Peter Banks, um, uh, Bill Bruford, um, uh, Jeff Downs, uh, and, uh, you know. Rick had come and gone eight times. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so the idea was to have a, yes, a, a, a whole Yes schema. Um, in fact, I didn't come up with the term Yes World. I went to John and said, you know, this is your website. I always deferred to yes. It was never me saying, this is what we're going to do, and you just have to go along with it. I always made sure that they got a final say. So, you know, usually they go along with my ideas or our ideas because um, they, they saw us as kind of the experts as far as this goes. So I said to John, what do you want to call this thing? And John said to me, um, call it Yes Speak. I mean, Yes Speak. Uh, he said, no, uh, or Yes World. So that's where I got Yes World, which was great because it was the role of yes. So, um, it, it was a, um, a frame paradigm. I don't know if you remember frames. So basically, uh, there are tabs. So there was Yes World proper with all all things about the current uh, version of Yes news and, and you know audio video and, and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. <clears throat> it was the kind of stuff that with that notes from the edge had accumulated over the years. And there was a whole separate section uh, which was called Yes Net, and that was the individual official sites for all, all the members, including the current members and former members. Yeah. So you had, one, you had one paradigm to go to, to where you could get to all the different YES members. And, you, know, you didn't have to uh, go outside of YES world because it was you know it, it was an inline frame uh, in, in the page and you still see all the tabs on the top. I remember so, that. Um, so th that was the concept for YES world. And, um, and at first we had a, a few minor glitches. Uh, we, it wasn't quite there when we first started, um, and um, uh, I think I showed uh, you saw a, uh, one of the logos, and I showed that logo to Roger Dean, and he absolutely hated it. So that's why he took you know like more classic yes yes shows um, type of um, uh, imaging and made that into an actual uh, yes world logo, and um, <clears throat> and it was kind of slow slow going at first, but uh, eventually we found our feet, and um, uh, the, the great thing was. Their management, um, people like Jeff Varner, Mike Lane, um, um, a few others. Um, I wish I your name right now, escape me. But uh, Mark Mark Salata, so it's really great people. They they could see the value of what I was doing. So um, and so they always treated me as a professional. And that's you know if I needed tour dates. You know it's not like I, they trusted me. It wasn't like I was going to take tour dates and say, hey, everybody look at me, I had tour dates and just yeah. put it out there. They never trust me. And you know, that wasn't what I would do anyway, but it was basically a matter of, um, yeah, I need the stuff in advance so I can prepare it. So when you go live, boom, there it is. And right. uh, <clears throat> that, that, that's pretty much how Yes World came about. In, interesting, were there any, at that first meeting, were there any, and I don't know how else to put it, Mike, but were there any like strange or kind of funny questions given the context of the time and the lack of knowledge of the internet other than what steve said about the <laughs> were, were there other things right. collectively from them i, I joke jokingly i wish i could say i assured them they would all have to have fax machines that they're ready but, <laughs> <laughs> but um, you know I'll be honest with you um uh steve i really don't remember much i don't think i don't think 
I'm there Dan. That's much. Steve. <laughs> that's okay. I get as confused too. <laughs> yeah, okay. same. It's totally. I'm sorry. Okay. I'm sorry. No, it's totally uh, okay. Really. <laughs> apologies. Um, uh, basically, John. <laughs> um, uh, but I want to tell you one little thing. I, uh, this is kind of um, um, something I probably would normally tell, but at the very end, I was kind of hanging around, and um, then you know, just kind of listening to them, hanging out with them. And Steve was like, in other words, get the hell out of here. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah, because it was like the bad time. Yeah. And I really, I didn't really pick up on that. I just thought we'd go just to kind of hang around and, and see if they had questions or wanted to talk. But, um, but you know, I, I took the hint and, you know, I got Microsoft to come back and get the monitor. The, the interview never really happened. It was interesting. It was at the time. Um, um, Alan was... Um, French with a guy named Reek Havoc. Reek Havoc. You know, right. You know, Reek, yeah. I remember Reek, him working Reek's with him. Reek's a drummer. Yeah. Uh, Reek's, Reek's an old friend that lives up here in the area, but he lives in the LA area now. And basically, um, um, he had, had gotten um, Alan to come to the um, uh, the AV department and develop uh, a, like like um, a kind of a game for Alan. And but the thing okay. is, at that time, people still had dial up modems yeah. and even even at Microsoft where we had these high speed lines I tried to get, go in and look at the game and it, it would just take forever literally like you know d dozens of minutes to ship from one thing to the other so <clears throat> they were kind of a little ahead of their time um, so that's cool um, a couple things uh, I want to read one of the comments I'm going to relay some stuff then sure. Steve has some sure questions but first I want to chime in myself and say for those who didn't see your first interview um, notes from the edge was the first website I ever signed up to get newsletters from and uh, yes world when I found yes world and then you talked about um, yes net I saw that and the first website I followed after that was Chris Squire's site I remember this stuff just so vividly and like you were there in the beginning which is really neat but adam sears from low bait scarf is watching adam i still got to send you that picture i talked about of the place near where i live i'll do that he says hey it's adam i'm watching from my apartment in la i loved yes net and yes world i discovered them when i discovered the internet at college and ordered the rare yes tape collection from someone i met on it I still have my Yes Tape collection. That's so cool. Thanks oh, for joining yeah. me. You remember that? <laughs> yes Tape? Yeah. That's cool. That, hey, Adam. Uh, thanks for, for that comment. Um, yeah, um, I, know, I, I remember getting that, too, when I first got involved. I was like, wow, all this really cool stuff, you know, all these outtakes and, and right. you know, bootleg stuff. And, and obviously, once we became officially affiliated with Yes, I think we, we stopped offering that stuff because, you know, I, I was really cognizant of, you know, being professional about it and not, not being fanboy and, right, and you know, jeopardizing. Right. And, and, and at that time, you know, you know, I think bands have rethought uh, the whole thing about, you know, uh, filming a concert, especially with cell phones being so yeah, big with us. Right. You know, back in the day, uh, if you were caught with, um, uh, you know, a camera and you weren't authorized, you know, you were you were in deep trouble. Yeah, they would throw a pie at your yeah. face and then drag you out by the ankles, basically. Yeah, but but that you know, it's here at home too. Steve, but, but, sorry. <laughs> Steve, you have some questions from a couple of the promo posts, right? Oh wait, wait, you're Steve, right? No, <laughs> <laughs> we're here with Fred Tiano. <laughs> <laughs> That's Freddie uh, to you, yeah. right? <laughs> Yeah, so I do have a couple questions. Um, one of them is from David Carlin, who says, Mike's a great guy. Please tell him I said hello and ask about his Steve Howe signature edition he bought from Steve Howe. Oh, I have, I have a great story about that. And, and hi, David. Uh, I've known David a while, and David has sometimes stepped in to help manage um, the Facebook notes from the Edge page. So thanks for doing that, David. And um, I really appreciate uh, the help that you've given me. And um, and, and, and so David's a, a, a one of those Facebook friends I really treasure. Um, was that a uh, signature so, acoustic or an ES-175? No, 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 that was the ES-175, okay. right? Yeah. Right, not, right, Dan? Yeah, I love that guitar. Right, I love Steve. that guitar. <laughs> I'll get you guys' names right someday. But yeah, um, <laughs> me too. Uh, well, uh, what happened was, um, 
I don't think it's a big deal to tell you guys this. Because I work for Steve Howe, I would get guitars from Martin at, uh, at half price. Yeah. So oh, when wow. the Steve Howe signature 0018 came out, um, uh, I got it at a really good price. And then I, I thank Steve for doing that. So the same thing with the ES-175. It was a signature ES-175. And I got it and and uh, it didn't play well and uh, looked kind of crappy around the edges. Really? And at that time, at that time Gibson, oh. unfortunately, uh, I think we're going through some changes. And um, <clears throat> forgive me, I, I, I wish you remember the gentleman's name, but he was he, he would actually uh, be like Steve's tour manager with Steve on, on his solo tours. Oh, Dwayne, I think Dwayne, that was his name. And uh, basically, um, so um, what I did was, um, I mentioned Dwayne Calvary back in the day, but basically, um, um, Mike Lowell is, was like a luthier uh, here in the Seattle area. Yeah, he died a couple of years ago, unfortunately. Mm. But, he, but everybody knew Mike Lowell. I mean, Pearl Jam, you know, Hart, all the local folks knew Mike Lowell. And even people coming through town, like, yes, they needed something done to their, their, their um, instruments. They would go to Mike Lowell. And Mike Lowell was an authorized Gibson dealer. And I took the ES-175 to him and said, it's a new instrument, what can I do? He said, he looked and said, you're going to have to have a, like a, a total refret done on this. And that's yeah. major if you don't know what that is. Yeah. And, um, and I said, well, well, I said, well, what else can I do? And he said, well, I'm an authorized dealer. Let me just send it back. And so I said, you just do that. I mean, I'm not going to have, you know, a brand new guitar totally remodified. Yeah, that's you know? crazy. And so apparently Dwayne got a, a wind of this and he made sure that was cleaned up and really, really uh, 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 well appointed before it got sent back to me. And, uh, and it's, a, it's, a, it's a pretty nice guitar. Um, so right. I, I have another story about that, the S-175 that may, may go into another question you may have. So uh, one of the tours, I think it was the Inflatables tour, uh, they were rehearsing at Paul Allen's uh, um, compound out on Mercer Island here. And it's like, like enormous side to side. Cindy and I had to sign non-disclosure agreements about it. So I can't say too much about it. So I go into the beautiful studio, which, you know, uh, ceiling to four windows overlooking Lake Washington, really gorgeous. And, you know, Steve's playing, like, yes, let's see if I takes off. It's just me here. I could play guitar. I was like, oh my God, he, he's going to be playing like 75, only like, like you know, um, uh, Steve Morse addiction drugs and that. Then I realized, wait a second. No, it's, it's, it's the uh, the reproduction of oh. the S one seventy five. Oh, funny! <laughs> but he gave me a start. He really did. But that's that's great. Call. Steve, was there more to that question, or another question you want to go to? Um, I have another question from a friend of mine. But is it okay if I ask one of my questions first? Yeah, it's your show. Okay. Uh, so, um, one of the things I want to ask about was. Um, Oh, like, do you, do you know why um, Yes didn't play more of Magnification on that Symphonic tour? I, I think you might have mentioned something about like yeah. About <clears throat> um, uh, I I think without, without going into too much detail because I don't want to betray any confidences, but but basically, I think Steve had a whole problem with how Magnification was mixed. Because um, the whole idea for magnification was Steve was going to pretty much um, come up with most material, and he was going to kind of kind of lead the way for it. Um, and um, and I don't think it was going quite as well as he wanted. So uh, I, Cindy and I uh, were sitting in on Bob Coburn's show, uh, um, Rockline, Rockline, yeah. Rockline, right? Rockline, and, yeah, um, Rockline. So they did a, a studio here in Seattle because um, I think a key. Um, KSW, no, um, uh, K, KZ, okay. Um, and, um, and so they were doing the studio there. Bob Cooper was remote. Rick, Rick Wakeman was, um, remote as well. He wasn't there. So it was just, uh, the four, uh, Chris, Allen, uh, Steve and John. <clears throat> and well, you know, then, you know, during rock line, they would play tunes, right? And it was interesting because they had a little conversation where, where, uh, John, Chris and Allen were trying to convince Steve to play more magnification. Because you know they weren't playing very much of it, like you right. know, it, um, um, in the in the presence of and and maybe the title two or something. Right. I can't remember. They didn't do very much, but you know, Steve was just for some reason he wasn't having it. He just did not want to do any more songs from magnification. So just for the fans out there, know that certain factions didn't want to do a lot more of 
magnification on the esophonic tour, but for some reason, uh, Steve um, kind of balked. And, you know, there might have been other mitigating fa factors, so I don't want to you pretend like that. You know what's like funny a, about that everything. to me? What's funny about that to me is that to listen to the album and the way it is mixed, Steve is very prevalent. So it's yeah. like I can't get my head around what the complaint is. That's really interesting, but... Um, yeah. It's a great album, but you're right. They only played those three songs. In the presence of, they played Magnification, and they played Don't Go. And that was it. That's a, Don't all go. Played. Yeah. Don't, don't play. <laughs> <laughs> beep, beep. <laughs> don't, what, don't, Asia, don't cry. Don't go. Like. Right. Yeah, I do, I do remember reading somewhere <laughs> that Steve listened to the mix and didn't like it, so they had to fix it. And so I, I guess, yeah, I can understand why he might not be a huge fan of that album then, which is a shame because, like, the final product, I think, is really good for the most part. Yeah, yeah, yeah I do too. I, and I think they kind of achieved their goal. Um, Larry Groupe you know, mm -hmm. did a really, really great job as far as um, doing the um, orchestrations. What's funny is that Trevor Raven didn't care so much for it. He thought he could have done a great job. And that maybe it would have been interesting for a former Yes member to come in and done the orchestration. Is that, that, I wish that kind of happened, but, but you yeah, know, that would have been interesting. Whatever it did, yeah. So. yeah, that would have been on par uh, with Trevor Horn coming on to produce 90125, yeah. you know, which is, and yeah. Tony K possibly manage it. I mean, that whole weirdness is bizarre. Yeah. Yeah. Steve, what else we got from the audience? Uh, so we got a question from my friend Chris, uh, who um, I, I got uh, your album Creators Fan for him, and he had some really nice things to say about it. So um, Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Showing yeah. the album cover right now while you ask the question. Okay. Yeah, so this is from Christian Molina, um, who says... When you listen to a song that inspires you, do you write something familiar? For example, or something similar. For example, do you use similar sounding chords that song has and rewrite or rearrange it your own way? What is your writing process like? Um, you know, I'm sure I probably echo a lot of songwriters in that uh, <clears throat> inspiration comes from different different areas. Sometimes it's um, uh, a situation you're you're addressing. Uh, briefly, if I can go into this, um, a natural which is one of my best, best songwriter the type of songs. Um, I was trying to write something for the disco area, uh, disco era, sorry, disco era. And um, hmm. and um, the uh, original lyrics were a feeling of malaise. She got me to first base and then her lovely case inside of a scowl. Uh, President to knock me out, the crowd began to shout. The bases were loaded and the, the, the bartender cried foul. And then it was, it was probably the kind of thing that went sustained in the long run. But after that came out, the wind that characterizes the evening. And that was just so evocative. And it wasn't the same song. Right. I, that, I'm going to ditch that first part because I already learned from There Behind You, which was written about uh, somebody else's situation, that uh, you can't sustain a song if it, if it doesn't really mean something to you personally. I was trying right. to write a commercial song. It probably wasn't really commercial to begin with. So uh, a natural came, came about to um, uh, be a song about writing songs um, and making sure that I address the right thing in the song for the, for, in this case, for the one I love. Um, and that, that song turned out really, really nice. Um, um, and some of it is just, you know, sometimes it just kind of comes to you, you know, as you're, as you're kind of playing it. Other times, you have a, a part of another song. Um, I think I may have mentioned this last, uh, last time that Dance of the Little Guys really originated from a John Lennon tribute song called The Silence for Around the World. So it was something I wasn't using anymore. So I kind of brought that part in. Um, so uh, sometimes That's I have some lyrics and it's just, I, I, I like some poetry I wrote and then it's just basically writing um, uh, the, um, the the song around that and having ideas around that and and, and just which is the Mike Tiano methodology is making sure that uh, that um, I, I I reiterate themes um, and that uh, that that they come back in a meaningful way. So Chris, to answer your question, um, uh, there is no one methodology. It really depends on what's happening at the time. And since I'm not a commercial songwriter, to where you know I I I. I I can, you know, just churn out tunes. Um, I, can, I can do that if I probably wanted to. 
but I kind of let the, the muse come to me. And that, that usually is my inspiration for, for writing something. So it depends on what's happening at the time and what I have available to me, both from um, music I've written and from lyrics I've written. That's cool. Yeah. Uh, Chris also has some positive comments about Creators Fan. Uh, so he says, Dance of the Little Guys is probably my favorite track because of the rhythm guitar chord progressions. The melodies the lead guitar plays is almost fairy tale like it's zeppelin esque mm. oh um, great that's yeah, a great compliment thank you yeah that's yeah neat. he also he also says automaton is another good one and automaton automaton <laughs> and he also says i smiled at uh mike's uh john lennon reference in triad w when i listen to prog rock it's like i'm looking at a painting there's so much to observe it was very prog rock Oh, that's nice. That's really Yeah, thank nice. you. Thank you, Chris. Thanks very much for those comments. Yeah, um, that's, that's great. great. That's really great. Uh, uh, um, a, lot, a lot of people like Automaton. I mean, uh, I really like the tune, too. And uh, uh, Steve McKnight did a, a wonderful guitar solo in it. I yeah. mean, that guitar solo just makes a song, <laughs> as far as I'm concerned. But um, uh, what was the first song you mentioned of the three? Dance of the Little Guys, right? Yes, yeah. the Little Guys, yeah. I, that's I one of my favorites. Last time, but, you know, again, Randy George gets all the credit for, for how wonderful that came out because I just did the 12th Street part and you worked out all the parts and uh, and Randy just just put did his thing and just made it something really really special. That's great. I have a musical question for you, Mike. Sure. Um, and it it might be the same person, and that's okay. But my question is, who's your biggest influence on your instrument, and who's your maybe other biggest influence musically, if it's not that same person. <clears throat> um, uh, and, well, and maybe <clears throat> it, even if you want to contain that to yes, you can or not, how, however you want to do it. Um, yeah, I'll say probably a big influence as far as what got me started um, uh, on playing the guitar was Neil Young. Nice. I was a big Neil Young fan. Um, and. Um, and I said to myself at one point, if I could play the needle and the damage done, then I think I'm on my way. It's just being able to play that 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 kind of um that finger style picking. Yeah, the finger picking. You kind you kind of you playing notes in, in conjunction with with other notes, you know. And um, 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 so Neil Young was a big influence. Um, I, I hesitate to do this as one. Um, Led Zeppelin was really a really big influence. I, I was a big Zeppelin in the day. I think I may mention this last time. And, and Jimmy Page, Jimmy Page was a huge influence on many levels because you know he had been in the industry for a long time, yeah. and so he would create a song as a song, and he didn't worry about going out and playing it later. You know, it was like right. he, he didn't write really stairway to heaven to think, think okay, I got. I got to think about how I'm going to play this so I play this exact same way live. No, he had, you know, the, the, the recorders, the sounds uh, that, that John Paul Jones would add. And he had yeah. an actual acoustic guitar um, and, and had a electric guitar as well. I had kind of all meshed together. Um, and that's one thing I really liked about Led Zeppelin was when you went to see them, you know, they, they didn't they didn't play the record. Yeah, they were know. two different bands. They were yeah. so fastidious yeah, exactly, in exactly. the studio yeah. and live, anything goes. They were so yeah. good at improvising within the framework of the song. But like you said, not worrying about, oh, we got two other rhythm guitars and I got to do with it. They just did what they did and it freaking yeah. worked no matter what. Yeah, right. So the other part of your question in terms of musically, um, uh, the, obviously the Beatles were a big influence. Um, as far as that goes, but uh, you know, I, I, I have to do, I obviously call a yes because um, they were the ones that that got me the whole thing about recapitulation. In oh. other words, you have you have a theme, you restate it later, you restate it in a, in a meaningful, interesting way, and that really influenced my own my own songwriting as well. As far as making sure that I I wove things in there that um, I was not. Um, Keep doing one thing too long, too, too repetitious. Um, that things were kind of moving all the time, and and like we mentioned, mentioned last time, we talked about last time, a song unfolds, and making sure that well, as it unfolds to beginning to end, that it it, 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 it takes you and it encapsulates you. 
yeah. you know, embraces you. Um, uh, so, um, um, you know, I, I, have, I have many, telling. many influences. I mean, uh, the different points in my, in my um, life, I could point to like the Who or the Jefferson Airplane. Yeah. Um, Crosby still is an astronaut, really big influence at one point. Um, um, and, How about, uh, later, did you ever yeah. get into um, Herschel Goldstein and the Bagel Slingers? No, I'm no. kidding. Are you serious? <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I have a bunch no, of I mean, band names. It's like a I mean, I have, I have three, three odd influences. Um, at one point, I worked out a whole a solo acoustic rendition on the on 12th Street of Moonlight Becomes You. Uh, oh, song of Big wow. Crosby sang in a, in a, a Bob Hope and Cros Big Crosby film. One of the road pictures, Road to Morocco, I think is what it was. So, yeah. you know, I have all these other uh, these other influences uh, uh, from throughout my life. Um, and you think about like what Yes did with um, Something's Coming? I yeah. mean, mm -hmm. that's a monumental song. That that really is. No, you know, and, and the fact they were creative enough to reimagine all the cover songs, that's what really made, made Yes as far as, you know, uh, doing other people's songs, they didn't just hate the songs. I look right. at America. I mean, I mean, oh, America was so different that Paul Simon said to see how you know you just take credit for it. Don't give yeah. me any credit for it. He loved but, it. Yeah, yeah. Interesting stuff. You know, you mentioned uh, the Beatles, and uh, Steve is going to later put the link to your article uh, about Get Back in the comments oh, of you. of this. And um, let's just each give just a few words on that film because we haven't talked about that okay. yet so this will be sure. real organic we'll, we'll start with steve since he's the youngest and the most farthest removed from being exposed to the beatles time wise <laughs> steve just give a few words like what was your impressions and how much were you into the beatles at the time you watched the film so i got into the beatles about 2009 so freshman year of high school you know everyone was talking about it because like the new rock band game was being marketed and right. i figured like right. uh, and by that point had gone through other prog rock bands discography so i figured you know what? i might as well give the beatles a listen since they influenced some of them and there's some really great stuff i think revolver is my favorite album oh there. yeah i'm um, with you yeah interesting <laughs> and um yeah, it gets very psychedelic. And so when Get Back uh, was coming out on Disney Plus, I I knew I had to watch it. And even though each installment, you know, it's three episodes, that documentary, each installment is pretty long, like two to three hours or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Each one, like I watched each one on a different day, but when I did watch an episode, I would just be entranced like i wouldn't feel bored at all like it's just all interesting throughout and you see how organic it, it all is between them how certain songs come together like um they'll be talking and then all of a sudden you'll hear um like do 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 and you're like oh that's how it started and yeah it's like, very interesting seeing that evolution and then the rooftop concerts i, I loved yeah. that documentary it's really good that's cool. And even though we're close in age, Mike, I am a little bit younger, so I'll go next with the same okay, question. Um, I, Beauty before age. Yeah, I, I, I was, I don't know why I was hesitant to watch it, only because, and I know I've got this on my wall, Sgt. Pepper, the original album, the sleeve and all that, but I was never like a huge, huge Beatles fan. Not that I didn't recognize how monumental they've yeah. been to everything yeah. that's happened since but i just never immersed myself in the catalog yeah. but from the first five minutes I, like steve used a great word i was entranced as well as was my wife and we watched every episode each night in a row and it was magnificently done and and really i think part of the magnificence is telling a story with the thousands of feet of footage they had that no one had reviewed or seen before it's like someone building a, 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 a jigsaw puzzle and then scattering it. And 50 years later, someone finds all these pieces and has to put the picture back together. It's yeah. truly an amazing feat that, that Peter did with that. I have one complaint, if I may. And my mm -hmm. wife and I shared this complaint. And it's not because my wife is black. That has nothing to do with it. But yeah. on the rooftop performance, they hardly showed... Billy Preston. 
And I, Billy I agree. was so I agree. Yeah, Billy was so <clears throat> instrumental in how that album came out. Let it be would not be let it be without Billy Preston. And he was hardly shown. And everyone could argue and say, well, it's the Beatles, this and that. Billy deserves so much credit for how that came out. They <sighs> hardly showed a glimpse of him on that rooftop performance. I'm sure there's there's a mile of footage of him laying on the floor somewhere. And that just breaks my heart, especially since he, he passed yeah. so young under unfortunate circumstances. Yeah. That's my only complaint. Other than that, still, I'll say it, truly magnificent, great storytelling. And like Steve said, really need to see a riff come out and be able to identify the iconic song that became. Yeah. So yeah. how about you? Oh, and I, like I said, I was never really heavily into the Beatles, um, but I've always embraced them. But what, how about you, Mike? Um, <clears throat> I, I don't want to uh, reiterate why I said my article. People can go read read it. So, um, right. um, but uh, um, I, for one, first of all, I say I agree with you completely about Billy Preston. I kept watching it and thinking, "Where's Billy?" Yeah, he was like over the side him. or something. You saw him and, in the and, background. And you, know, <laughs> and, you know, and the Beatles were so busy being the Beatles and playing that they probably you know weren't aware of what was going on. It was just probably the powers that be saying, you know, keep it just to the, to the four of them, you know. Yeah. <clears throat> but but I agree with you that just close on Billy Billy Preston. Um, the, the thing is, Paul could have come in and said, "Hey, let's just if the, the goal is to show what a, a cool little dance combo we are, you know, then yeah. just keep it just the four of you and don't think about other keyboard parts." But by that point, they were incorporating a lot of whether it's piano or organ into these songs. So it was like, okay, we need someone to play lead and to keep the rhythm going because we have more than one guitar part. So how do we do this? So it was really, really, really um, essential that they they pulled someone like Billy in. They talk about Nicky Hopkins, but right. uh, Billy was a natural progression. So, but basically, um, uh, what I really like about the article I wrote was that I just for the point of view from someone who lived through the Beatles experience. Right. You know, uh, so by the time Abbey Road was like a was like a really triumph, it was great. But by the time Let It Be came out, all the the, the BS about about um, the money uh, money situation that Paul wanted to go with his his father in law Lee Eastman and you know uh, John George and wanted to go with Alan Klein, and it was just getting really really ugly. And <clears throat> the way Paul kind of severed the relationship. Um, but with, you know, this press release that kind of put down the other guys, or mainly John and Yoko, and then, you know, for, uh, to promote McCartney, his first solo album. Um, <clears throat> at that time, when Let It Be came out, it looked awful. It was filmed with 16 millimeter. Um, it, it, it basically just, just supported the narrative that the Beatles were over and maybe fine, just shut the door on them. But what Peter Jackson did, uh, was he he he, did, he brought back the wonder of the Beatles. Now I remember reading um, an essay that Martin Scorsese wrote for a remaster for um, the film Help, and he basically said we expected uh, you know um, the output of the Beatles during the time, but we never really thought about the wonder of it. And I thought that's what Peter Jackson brought back to the Beatles. Got yes. yeah, back is that <clears throat> as he said. It wasn't uh, uh, just they were just going to motions and sneering at each other. They were actively being the Beatles. They were yeah. actively working out tunes. I mean, and you know, they were working collaboratively. Like, you know, George would say, oh, I, I don't know what to do here about something. And John would say, you know, just say cauliflower or something until the <laughs> word comes. And they were just um, um, all interact as and working out the tunes together uh, so um you know and and it was interesting to see just the the creative process like yeah. paul kept wanting to say well you know um um don't be down it's kind of corny saying i'm gonna look for the first time so but it's not as corny we come back ah, nah, yeah, the first time. but john wasn't having it so it's kind, <laughs> kind of put the kibosh on that and that probably goes to what led george to leave the band you know just paul right. saying no it should be this it should be this but the member like George or John saying, no, this is my song. It should be this. So, right. um, but, but, you know, um, whereas the, the film let it be in 1970 basically kind of amped all the, uh, the disagreements and unpleasantness, you are watching it. There was hardly any of that. You're I'm right. Sure there was one, one point where George got pissed off and left, but it wasn't like 
full of moments like that. And right. I think that's where Peter Jackson excelled. He's, and that's where he said, you know, I'm sure people, this was fun. And for those of us who lived through it, it was like, no, there's no way. There's no way. We lived through it. We know that. But we saw for ourselves, thought, oh, my God. And and being Beatles fans, we love to see George and Ringo working out Octopus's Garden or, you know, um, 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 John uh, uh, Paul trying to do Teddy Boy. These songs that would go into other things. They were just so full of music. They would just throw things out there. And then they just kind of cleverly pick and choose. Um, of what, what's put on there. So I encourage people to read my article. Uh, I think yeah. it's one of my best works. And, and, and Steve uh, already put the link in the comments. So yeah, yeah. So thank gotta, you. Gotta that, 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 that covers how, how I feel about it. It yeah. just brought back the wonder of the Beatles. So thank That's you, Mark true. Scorsese, for that word. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Peter brought back the wonder of King Kong. So why not then? What do you do after that? Take on something bigger, the Beatles. <laughs> <laughs> like, um, I said, like I said in the article, he was at the right place at the right time because he had done that World War I um, movie where he just made the footage look stellar. He had some um, artificial intelligence technology to actually parse out like guitar sounds and people talking. So things were a lot clearer. So it's, uh, it's, a, it's a totally different animal, like yeah. I said in the article. Yeah. Awesome. Um, folks. We are going to have Mike Tiano back on because he's got other stuff in the works. We want to know how things progress with your album. And uh, do you have any inclination to do a follow up? Oh, you know, I, I, I don't want, want people to think that even though I call this my audio biography, that was a whole banana. Um, I had one really great song, probably my most progressive song called Take a Chance, which um, really had a strong Genesis influence. Um, oh, uh, and um, the thing is, I just didn't. I, I, I probably wouldn't have had time to put on the album anyway. I was intending for it to be on Creators Fan, but uh, it just didn't get there. And, and the people I had playing on it, they, they were saying, I really can't figure this thing out. And I thought, well, if you can't figure it out, then you know how the people will play on it. So so I kind of showed that. I have a lot of other songs. Um, I think it's more a matter of once uh, things start settling down, um, right. uh, I, I have some medical issues I'm going to, but I need to uh, attend to. Nothing terrible with but, um, but kind of impactful. I need to, to take her up. And then I'll probably just go onto my laptop and, and start laying down tracks. And, you know, Steve Smith, who does such a great job on, on mixing a uh, creative fan. Um, um, you know, he, he mentioned that it'd be great to just go back to the studio and do some stuff together. Um, uh, part, part of the issue is, um, uh, <laughs> is <laughs> funding it is what it is, you know. Because yeah. there's a big uh, challenge for musicians these days, you know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, things so, cost so, more than they uh, so I would like to have that I would like to have a follow up. And yeah. sure I'd like to come back. Maybe I could be your Ed McMahon. Ed oh, McMahon to your cool. Johnny Carson's. There you go. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll be Karnak. And I hope you got to all, Where's the all, the all, the all these references are just going over my head. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh I know you were talking about things on Facebook that what the heck is he talking yeah. about? <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm talking about, like, the Lion King and stuff. <laughs> I, I don't know Lion King, but there's some other, other weird stuff that, that I'm just not have to, so. Yeah. Oh, yeah, it's probably for the best. I'm really weird. <laughs> <laughs> I know time just flies. I'm, I wish you, I hope, I hope you didn't leave anybody out of your questions, and maybe I can get to them next time. But, yeah, um, no, absolutely. Thanks, everybody, thanks, everybody, for submitting the questions. There were yeah. some good ones there. And, and I have... Uh, what we're going to close out to close out with in a moment is I'm going to do with you what I do with my guests on Jump Talk TV. And that is a uh, Mike Tiano fun fact questions. And I'm going to ask you some rapid fire questions to give you as little time to think about them as possible and just bring them to mind. OK, you ready? Here we go. Yeah. Let's get to really know Mike Tiano, you know a lot about his musicality, his album, his influences and all that, but what about paper or plastic? Uh, paper. Ren or Stimpy? Ren. Sir Galahad or Sir Lancelot? Sir Galahad. Jimmy Page or Ron Wood? Jimmy Page. Favorite beverage? What? Favorite beverage. Fa fa favorite beverage. Um, um, uh, a margarita. Favorite dinner dish? Oh, God. I, yeah, I'm on a seafood diet. You know, I love the, uh, seafood. seafood yeah, that works. Um, That's an answer. Um, a pizza. 
Okay, and if you could travel to anywhere in the world that you haven't been to yet, where would it be? Other than my house, of course. <laughs> um, I, I like to see Paris, really. Ooh, nice. And who is the one musician you haven't interviewed yet that you'd like to interview? Oh, God. Um, uh, that's, that's a really good question. Um, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, um, my mind's like, does that have to be a, have to be a musician? Does that have to be living or alive? No, <laughs> um, no, it could be either. No. Alfred Hitchcock. Ooh, I love that. Oh, yeah. mom Bernard Herrmann. Huge... Bernard oh. Herrmann. Oh, wow, that's good too. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. Steve, you got a couple to throw in there? Um, <laughs> I wasn't really expecting to, but of. Uh, I guess this is kind of more related, but I was going to say favorite Yes song. Oh, that's so probably funny. Close to the Edge. I mean, that was probably the most influential to me, really. Right. As and our to song rock, rating. I think. Yeah, Close to the Edge, definitely. Great. And folks, now you've gotten close to Mike Tiano. This episode is the return of Mike Tiano. If you haven't seen his first interview, look it up. It's on our Yes Shift page on Facebook. It's also on our audio podcast at anchor.fm slash Yes Shift. And Mike has something really cool to show us. Go ahead, Mike. Uh, so, um, so basically, um, I know that people can hear my album um, streamed on various forces like Apple Music, um, Amazon Music, YouTube. Um, I'm off of Spotify. I kind of follow the wave as Good. far as that goes. Okay. I kind of agree with what Neil Young and Joey Mitchell and, and all those people were saying. Absolutely. And, 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 you know, it's not like, you know, I'm some gigantic artist that's going to make any difference to anybody. But it's part of the movement. You're part of the um, you know, it's, it's just it's just kind of the right thing to do. Yeah, yeah. you just have to, to, sh to show where you, you, you stand and, you know, um, where you hold your cards. Um, so, but, you know, I hope people... Do take the opportunity to buy my CD, Creators, Creators Fan. Um, not only has the lyric sheet, but has the, the artwork that kind of inspired the title. It's so and cool. the, what I'm going to offer folks is that um, if they go to PayPal, go to .com, and they order um, my album through PayPal, that actually I fulfill those personally. I will send them this uh, um, Hold close. collectible yes sticker. Look at um, that. That is cool. The yes logo comes out. Out for, away from the background, and basically it was a promotion for In a Word Live, and so I will send one of those with each uh, CD. I'll you know, grab it if you want me to. And um, and but basically, well, included there is um an offer for what I call the poster pack. A, a few years back, I offered uh, various Yes posters. One's a gorgeous one that shows all the seventies um album covers. Um, Ooh. and there's that, and one for uh, the Word Is Live. And uh, one for Yes Speak. And I have a Yes 35 a sticker. Uh, uh, what I'll do is um, if you buy my album through PayPal, you'll all not automatically get this this wonderful sticker at no extra charge. Yeah, and I'll send yes. uh, I'll send a little, little uh, printout with what the offer is for the posters. And basically the posters, I just basically want to um, um, clean out my garage. So um, <laughs> uh, I'm going to pr pretty much ask for just um, uh, ask you to contact me and just pay the postage, pretty much. Postage and handling for shipping those to you. And I'll be glad to get those to you. But if you buy, if you buy the album, Creators Fan, you'll get all the information through there. And if, and if you're really interested without buying the album, <laughs> tough. <laughs> now you can contact me, I guess. But um, that's what I want to offer. So um, I, I thanks, Stephen, yeah, for allowing me to to let people know about that. Um, I hope you're both enjoying the album still. Definitely. It's, yeah. in fact, I was going to hold it up and open it when you talked about the artwork, but it's in my truck and I locked the keys in my truck before the show. I have to call AAA. <laughs> oh, I, I, well, I don't have open one, but uh, here's what it looks like. Here's man. And if yeah. you open it up, um, it's got uh, artwork that I created when I was, when I was a youngster in my twenties. It's um, really cool so. folks. Really so. super cool. Um, yeah. I, I actually listened to it again. Um, and it felt like listening to it with fresher ears. And I don't know if it was because I rewatched Wayne's World recently, but I realized that the opening track there behind you has kind of that feel like Bohemian Rhapsody, where you could imagine people like 
b- blasting it in the car, just like rocking out to it, bobbing their heads. Yeah. It's, it's got so much packed into it. That's cool. Very cool. Mike, hang on the line after we say goodbye to the audience. Thank I sure. you so much for joining us. Steve, thank you again for letting me be on our show again. <laughs> <laughs> Steve, I have to have have talk with you about that. <laughs> <laughs> and folks, you can follow us on facebook.com slash yes shift, anchor.fm slash yes shift. And Steve, they can email us too, but why and where? Uh, you can email us at yes shift podcast at gmail.com. And you can send in feedback or comments on stuff we've talked about, and we might read what you sent us on the show. And we'll even take show suggestions. We've taken a few and have turned them into episodes. So it's your show, too. Thanks so much for following what we do, and uh, we'll see you soon. Bye-bye. Thanks, everybody.